It's codenamed J35Y8, and it's the new V6 for the 2023 Honda Pilot. Except that this time, Honda's dropped its iconic variable valve timing VTEC and added an additional camshaft for each bank. I'm talking about the first naturally aspirated dual overhead cam V6 in any Honda or Acura since the first generation NSX. Today, we're looking at the new V6 engine, why Honda dropped VTEC, and how this engine will be significantly cheaper cheaper. Let's just dive right in. So the new V6 has the same bore, stroke, and compression ratio as the previous engine. In other words, the diameter of the cylinder is the same. Also, the phase of the engine cycle when the piston travels from top to bottom or vice versa is the same. And the ratio of the volume of the cylinder combustion chamber with its piston at the bottom position and top position is also the same. But now, here's what's interesting. It's not what this new engine has, but what the engine has left behind. Instead of Honda's iconic VTEC system, it has an additional set of camshafts by way of the TLX Type S's double overhead cam heads. To appreciate the change, you have to understand what VTEC is in the first place. Most car enthusiasts have heard of VTEC, but to be honest, not many understand or appreciate how it works. VTEC is a type of variable valve timing system that Honda specifically developed. It's been used in Honda and Acura models since 1989, including the Acura NSX and Integra Type R, as well as the Honda S2000 and the Civic Type R. VTEC helps improve the efficiency of the engine and enables the engine to perform a lot better at higher RPMs. And the VTEC system also gets you low fuel consumption at lower RPM. But here's the thing, the Honda VTEC system is distinct and is nowhere near the average variable valve timing system you find in other cars. Most other systems increase the oil pressure to shift the timing of the camshaft and open the valves earlier. But the Honda VTEC engine has two different cam profiles on a single camshaft. First, we have two rocker arms with their own low profile cams for each cylinder. The engine operates these when you're at low RPM and low load and the rocker arms are on lock. And then there's also a central rocker arm with its own high profile cam. It's unused at low RPMs, but at higher RPMs, the engine operates with a larger cam profile. As engine speed rises, the piston inside the rockers gets pressurized with oil, and that locks all three cams together to increase valve load. In other words, the opening gets bigger and therefore enables more air to get into the engine. And actually, that's why you hear the iconic sound of the VTEC kicking in. It's that raw, loud, high revving signature sound that gets your adrenaline running. Funny enough, Honda first came up with the VTEC concept in the 1980s. It used it first for its CBR 400 motorcycle back in 1983. At that time, the concept was called Revolution Modulated Valve Control, or REV for short. It wouldn't be another six years until Honda would first add VTEC to one of its cars. The 1989 Honda Integra XSI, thereby creating an uproar in the car industry. Other car makers use variable valve timing, but they use different mechanisms and technologies. For example, BMW has valve trauma. Toyota's technology is called VVTL slash I. Honda wasn't the first to use variable valve timing, but it was a pioneer with its VTEC technology because it was the first car maker to combine lockable rocker arms and dual profile cams. It enabled Honda to combine two engine characteristics into one single engine and change it while it was still running. The concept and mechanism itself is so simple in hindsight, yet the output and result was remarkable. Anyway, here's the thing about the Honda's new V6. It doesn't have Honda's signature VTEC system at all. And it comes as a surprise, since VTEC has been so iconic to Honda. It begs the most obvious question. If VTEC's so great, why is Honda ditching it on this engine? The new J35Y8 V6 engine boosts the horsepower up to 285 horses in total in the new Honda Pilot. That's just a nominal gain of 5 horsepower. And the car retains its current 262 pound-feet of torque. But where the new engine really shines is when it comes to emissions. And that's why Honda ditched its VTEC. So you can blame it on emissions and regulations. It turns out the new engine is significantly cleaner than preceding ones. We're talking some 40 to 50% reduction in emissions with this new engine. Part of this efficiency improvement comes down to the engine's improved direct injection system. This improved system means more precise fuel delivery. On top of that, the system can also add up to three sprays for combustion cycle. And in the process, it uses smaller injector holes. And because there's no VTEC, the cam phasers can now continuously and precisely adjust intake and exhaust timing. 
But, well, let's just say that there hasn't been too much excitement around the new engine. Actually, some Honda fans are pretty disappointed since it doesn't have the same performance gains that Honda owners were hoping for. But here's the thing. Its intent is to help Honda bridge the gap until it either electrifies its current lineup or develops new EVs. Honda's another late bloomer in the EV game. It's trying to catch up with this newer, cleaner V6 as a stopgap measure. In the car world, Honda's been neck to neck with Toyota. These two Japanese car giants have been making waves for years. If you ask me, I think competition in the car industry is a good thing. It's what moves the car makers to constantly up their game, take risks, and innovate. And that's good for the end consumer, us. Honda and Toyota's rivalry have been described as one of the hottest rivalries in the industry. Each offer its own unique cars, some of which have become very iconic, with a cult-like following. Each company has influenced the entire car industry for decades. But of course, these two companies aren't exactly alike. They may share similar interests, but there are key differences between the two. For example, if you look at Honda, you'll see that Honda puts its focus on speed and handling, in contrast to the Toyota, which prioritizes dependability and reliability instead. Despite different strategies, each have put out some of the most legendary car engines to date. Toyota just doesn't have one specific famous engine. Rather, Toyota is generally known for everything from its tiny three cylinders to a V10 and even iconic inline sixes. Honda, on the other hand, is quintessentially famous for VTEC engines. VTEC's been around for 30 plus years. In fact, there are five particular VTEC engines that are notable in my book as the top Honda engines of all time. You could say these engines were VTEC milestones in their own right. It first started with the 1989 Honda Integra XSI. That was the first Honda to ever use the VTEC system, and it came with a V16 engine, which some Honda fans still call one of the greatest engines of all time. The first generation B16A engine was a 1.6 liter four-cylinder double overhead cam VTEC engine. It output 160 horsepower at 7,600 RPM and 110 pound-feet of torque at 7,000 RPM. It was also a milestone because it was the first ever mainstream nationally aspirated engine to hit the 100 horsepower per liter mark. I say mainstream because if you want to get technical, the first production car to hit that mark was the Ferrari 250 GTO. But let's be real, Ferrari's not really mainstream. A year later, we saw the C30A, and we saw it in the NSX, which is Honda's first attempt at a super sports car. That's when Honda started getting into Formula One. The first generation C30A was a three liter double overhead cam VTEC, naturally aspirated V6 engine. And this engine churned out 270 horsepower at 7,300 RPM, 209 pound-feet of torque at 6,500 RPM. Half a decade later, we then had the B18C and the 1995 Honda Integra Type R DC2. I'm talking about a 1.8 liter four cylinder double over cam VTEC engine. The engine pumped out 197 horsepower at 8,000 RPM. Max torque was 131 pound feet at 7,200 RPM. In fact, it was hailed as the ultimate Honda VTEC. Others called it the greatest front wheel drive performance car ever, and even the best handling front wheel drive car ever, and it was for its time. Another notable VTEC was the F20C. The first car to be blessed with that engine was the 1999 Honda S2000 Roadster. It was a front engine, rear wheel drive sports car with an open top. We're talking a two liter four cylinder engine that generated 246 horsepower at 8,600 RPM and a maximum torque of 150 pound feet of torque at 7,500 RPM. The F20C won the record for the highest specific output of a naturally aspirated engine in a production car. And in fact, it held that record for a solid 11 years. It wasn't until 2010 when Ferrari beat the record with 458. And even that, it only trumped the record by a mere one horsepower per liter. Ha! And of course, we had the famous K-Series engine. It was the successor to Honda's iconic B-Series engine as a flagship four-cylinder double overhead cam engine. It was larger than the B-Series since its engine displacement ranged from 2 to 2.4 liters, compared to the B-Series engine, which ranged from 1.6 to 2 liters. We saw the K-Series engine in Honda from the early 2000s till the mid-2010s. And actually, it's still even used in current Civic Type Rs. In particular, the K20A is especially noteworthy. It's a high-performance variant that you see in the Type R model like the DC5 Integra Type R and the FD2 Civic Type R. I'm talking 222 horsepower at 8,000 RPM and peak torque of 159 pound-feet of torque at 6,100 RPM. 
But let's talk a bit about the pros and cons of a VTEC engine. Even though Honda's new engine doesn't have VTEC, previous models do. So if you're in the market for a Honda, for example, it'll help you know the pros and cons of VTEC. I'd say that the biggest advantage to VTEC is, well, basically, VTEC is the replacement for displacement. VTEC gives you a ton of power at very high RPM. Contrast that with an average ordinary engine with standard variable valve timing, and it's not possible. So if you're looking to get power and you want to save a few bucks, VTEC is probably one of your best bets. And even if your vehicle out puts let's say 110 horsepower it'll feel a lot faster than a car that generates more power that's because you'll have to shift later and beat a car with more power in a straight line they say the sky's the limit when you're running a VTEC. VTEC also delivers significant fuel economy at lower rpms especially if it's a single overhead cam VTEC. reason is it has one cam shaft but bear in mind, VTEC has a set of disadvantages too. I'd say one of the biggest is that turbo engines are longer VTECs. I mean, they might be called VTEC, but that's not the case. That's because the VTEC is moved to the exhaust camshaft instead of the intake. So no more performance or the sounds of the VTEC kicking in. The first thing any real Toyota fan notices about the 2022 Tundra is that it's missing a V8 engine. Instead, this year's model comes with a twin turbo V6 or a hybrid V6. This definitely helps with fuel economy, but let's be real. If you need a Tundra for work purposes, you want to prioritize a strong workhorse with power and performance, and you'll care less about EPA ratings or green energy. In the year 2000, when Toyota first released the Tundra, it was the first ever full-size pickup built by any Japanese car maker in North America. To this day, the Tundra is only built and sold in North America. It's been a staple in the trucking community for more than 20 years. Now, 20 years might sound like a lot, but actually, Toyota's American roots aren't really deep when it comes to full-size trucks, when you're comparing it to its largest competitors like Ford, Chevy, and Dodge. Toyota initially produced the Tundra in Indiana. Later, production moved to the Toyota plant in San Antonio, Texas. That was in 2008, and that's where they're still manufactured at the same plant that Tacomas used to be made in. No, the Tacomas are made in Mexico. Now, not many people know this, but the word Tundra actually came after a lawsuit. Kind of fitting, given that America is a land of lawsuits. The story goes that Toyota originally wanted to call the truck the T-150 because it replaced their smaller truck, the T-100. Believe it or not, Ford actually sued Toyota, saying that the name T-150 was too similar to their well-known F-150 series. So, Toyota reconsidered and bowed out, and that's how the Tundra was born. Historically, the Tundras have always come with the option of either a V8 or a V6, but now, this new 20 2022 model kicks off the third generation. Toyota completely redesigned the truck, and for the first time ever, consumers do not have an option for a V8 at all. It's a bit ironic, actually, because when Tundra was first introduced, America's hailed it for its V8. In fact, Toyota deliberately made the Tundra to replace the T100, which only came with a V6. Now, it's as if they're going in reverse. Beep, beep, beep. So, will this be a deal breaker for some? If you're wondering what the big deal is anyway, well, whether Toyota nixing the V8 is good news for you or not depends on the type of vehicle you really need. At the end of the day, that's the bottom line. If you're driving around a family every day for general daily use, then a V6 is fine. One of the biggest advantages of a V6 is that it has less cylinders than a V8, so it weighs less. Less weight means it's less nose heavy, which means better navigation and acceleration. In other words, it's easier to manage your corners, curves, and turns. If you time your acceleration correctly, you'll notice an improved performance compared to the V8. That's because the V6 has less tendency to fade or drift to the outside. If you were to get a V6 instead of a V8, you'd also have the advantage of fuel economy. And no one would reject that given today's gas prices. V8s, on the other hand, are really thirsty beasts. Another advantage to the V6 is the fact that it has fewer parts compared to the V8 design. Fewer parts mean less maintenance, and less maintenance means less stress. True, there can still be expensive problems that will happen to a V6. Look, it's not perfect. But when it comes to the overall lifetime expense, in general, V6s will be less to repair in the long run. Point is, for light or general everyday passenger use, you're not going to lose out on anything necessarily by choosing a V6 over a V8. But let's compare the output of a V6 versus V8 in general. Take the Ram 1500, for example. A Ram 1500 with a standard 3.6 liter V6 engine can output 305 horsepower and 269 pound-feet of torque. And it has a towing capacity of 7,730 pounds. The Ram 1500 with a 5.7 Hemi V8 will give you 395 horsepower and 410 pound-feet of torque. Without its e-torque feature, the V8 can tow more than 11,000 
1,600 pounds. So you see, a V6 powered truck can't tow as much as a V8 powered one. That all said, there are some high quality SUVs on the market today that can tow large weights without requiring the V8 under the hood. Take the Ford Expedition EcoBoost, for example. It can tow up to a whopping 9,200 pounds. That's all thanks to its 460 pound feet of torque. This vehicle actually has the highest tow rating of its classification within the V4 to V8 class. Did you know that back in the day, V6 muscle cars were actually pretty sad and slow, to say the least. Anything other than a V8 engine was considered embarrassing. But today, it's a completely different story. Cars like Camaro that actually feature V6s produce decent power. And today's automatic transmissions are more up to the task than they used to be. Even Land Rover has transformed their lineup, mostly V8 engines, to the V6 variety. You can still work with the manufacturer to upgrade your vehicle if you want to. But their V6 engines still give you horsepower and torque that the average daily driver needs. But now, if you're not an average driver, this is a different story. For example, let's say your work requires you to use a workhorse every day. Well, in that case, a V6 is probably not the engine for you. If you regularly need to pull heavy equipment with your truck, a V8 engine will be more efficient. Really, the top reason why anyone should choose a V8 over a V6 is because of the advantage when it comes to hauling something. A V8 provides the necessary torque and balance. The rear torque ratios of V8 are designed for optimal towing performance. Many drivers also say the V8 produces a smoother and quieter ride than a V6. Can a V6 truck get your job done? Maybe. But there would be an extra unpleasant factor you might want to consider like noise. If you're dead set on getting a V6, then your best bet to getting anywhere close to towing power of a V8 is to have an upgraded V6 diesel. If you commute to your work site with a lot of equipment on your truck, large SUV or cargo van, then you need the power a V8 provides. You'll get a better launch off the line or an improved start with a heavy load. Only a small handful of V6 sports cars and trucks come even close to creating the power of a V8. Now let's jump back to towing for a bit. Not many people know this, but historically many full-size truck maters loaded their towing ratings. Naturally, this created a lot of confusion among consumers. So the Society of Automotive Engineers, or SAE for short, created standards for vehicle towing. Basically, it was a series of tests to determine the real towing capacity of a truck. That was back in 2010. It's called J2807, and it applies to vehicles up to 14,000 gross vehicle weight. Believe it or not, when these standards came out initially, the Tundra was the only full-size truck in the market that was J2807 compliant. Toyota called it the truth in towing standard. Initially, many other truck makers refused to use the standard, and suffice to say, they received criticism. Since then, there are other trucks on the market today that are also J2807 compliant. If you wonder why this year's Toyota Tundra doesn't have a V8 option, well, previously there were iterations of the Tundra that did. In fact, previously it came with a 5.7 liter V8 that was capable of generating 381 horsepower. But that doesn't mean the V8s are completely dead, at least not yet. The factory in Japan will allegedly continue to produce V8 for a few vehicles that still need them. But this wasn't a long-term plan to begin with. So why nix the V8? Well, Toyota dished it simply because they decided it wasn't ideal or necessary since they're gas guzzlers. The V8 only gets 13 miles a gallon in the city and 17 miles a gallon on the highway. So you can see that is dismal. But being unnecessary wasn't the only bad news for the V8. There are also the EPA's fuel economy standards. Last year, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA for short, released some stricter and more aggressive fuel economy standards. They stated that officially their goal was promoting electrification, but if you ask me, all that did was encourage more cars to have smaller engines that are just turbocharged. And these won't come anywhere close to what we need to haul and tow heavy loads. It's not like-for-like -like performance capabilities required of the V8. Now, by the 2026 model year, automakers will have to meet or exceed the fleet-wide average of 55 miles per gallon for cars and light trucks, all thanks to the EPA. During the Trump administration, we had a 43 miles per gallon standard that was set for the 2026 model year. So you can see the standard has only gone up since then. The EPA defended itself by saying this move will save drivers here in the U.S. somewhere between $210 billion and $420 billion in fuel costs. And that'll supposed to be all the way through 25th, if you're thinking. Yeah, right. Well, the EPA firmly believes that by the year 2026. Consumers will save up to a thousand bucks by buying an e for the lifetime of their vehicle. And if you think the EPA has done well, you're in for a surprise. They aren't finished with their plans by a long shot. They also announced a plan to initiate a separate round of legislation for new multi-pollutant emission standards using the Clean Air Act. And these standards will target 2027 model year vehicles. So what's the point? Well, President Biden announced an executive order called Strengthening America Leadership in Clean Cars and Trucks, which is geared toward getting cars and light trucks in the U.S. as close to zero tail 
tailpipe emissions as possible. But this isn't something that's being passed through the U.S. Congress. It's a legislation through an executive order and administration of law. That means you got a small group of people with the power and authority to decide on the future of your car. They can even decide on what kinds of vehicles you're allowed to own or what can be under their hoods. But let's return to the 2022 Toyota Tundra. Sure, it doesn't have a V8 engine, but Toyota actually completely redesigned and engineered the Tundra for the 2022 model year. And here's one re-engineering feat in the Tundra that's got everybody talking. Toyota was able to bump the Toyota's max towing capacity from 10,200 pounds to 12,000 pounds. That means the Tundra can tow more than the heavy-duty Nissan Titan XD. So does that make the 2022 Tundra a heavy-duty truck? Well, the answer will surprise you. Heavy-duty trucks are not actually classified by their tow rate. They're classified by their gross vehicle weight rating, or GVWR for short. GVWR means that bind weight of the truck and its maximum payload is above 8,500 pounds. Now, the all-new Toyota Tundra can haul between 1,575 and 1,940 pounds in its bed. That's a far cry from the heavy-duty truck payload requirement. That means that technically the 2022 Tundra is still a light-duty head-on truck. It's not heavy-duty like that F-250, Ram 2500, and up. But being a light truck doesn't mean that the Tundra is completely useless. The 2022 Toyota Tundra does have some noteworthy features worth mentioning. The 2022 Tundra is among the first Toyota vehicles ever to take advantage of connected technologies with a completely redesigned multimedia system. You have the option of either standard 8-inch or 14-inch touchscreen panel. You can interact with this interface through touch, sight, and voice. Its native navigation system is entirely cloud-based, which means you can get real-time over-the-air updates. And the Toyota's voice assistant is advanced with a wider range of natural voice activated responses. Saying anything from hi to yo can get the attention. Personally, I'm undecided on that for now. But anyway, we'll see how customers feel about this new system. There's been a lot of hype about Mazda's plans to add a rotary engine to the MX-30. But here's the thing. It's just a compact rotary engine, and it doesn't even power the car. Actually, it's a range extender. In other words, it powers the charger to add more battery capacity. Think of it like a generator. That's why some consumers are saying Mazda's rotary engine is just a marketing gimmick. Basically, Mazda took the EV, then added a rotary combustion engine, and turned it into a plug-in hybrid, or P-H-E-V. If you look inside the Mazda MX-30 e Skyactiv REV, you'll find a 17.8 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, a 160 PS electric motor, and the new 830 cc single rotor 70 PS Wankel rotary engine. Now I don't know if you remember, but back when Mazda first announced this iconic Wankel rotary engine will be making a comeback, Mazda fans got excited. But then they clarified that the rotary engine would come in the form of a range extender for an electric vehicle. In the battery electric version of the MX-30, the battery powers the motor, which then turns energy into moving at the wheels through the car's drivetrain. Pretty simple, right? But the problem with the MX-30 BEV is that it's powered by a 35.5 kilowatt hour battery pack. Tiny battery means tiny range. I'm talking only about 124 miles, and that's on a good day. To put that into perspective, just look at the EVs that the MX-30 is competing against. Take, for example, the Hyundai Kona Electric. It offers more than double that range. On top of that, the Kona Electric Electric has a slower starting MSRP, so it's a no-brainer which EV offers more value. If you're wondering why Mazda even released to the market an EV with lower range, well, evidently, Mazda felt the driving range would be sufficient. Apparently, it did some research and found that the average commuter only travels 30 miles a day. So, from that perspective, it has 124 miles of range, which is plenty enough for those small trips. Anyway, I'm sure this all had a bearing on why Mazda went back to the drawing board. And now, its solution is to add a compact rotary engine that will serve as a generator to help with the EV's driving range. But now, remember, the rotary engine doesn't power the wheels of the MX-30 REV. It runs between 2,500 to 4,500 RPMs to generate more charge for the MX-30's onboard battery. And here's the beauty of it. It extends the EV's range from a measly 124 miles to an impressive 400 miles. So you can see it's quite a jump. But that's not the only change we'll see in the MX-30. Because of the addition of the rotor extender, the MX-30 REV is getting a smaller battery pack. By small, I mean a 17.8 kilowatt hour battery pack compared to the 35.5 kilowatt hour battery pack in the battery electric version of the MX-30. To understand what this means, if we're to rely solely on the REV's smaller battery without the rotor engine extender, we're looking at 53 miles of range in electric only mode. 
Now, the rotary engine range extender on the MX-30 REV is super light. I'm talking 33 pounds lighter than RX-8's twin rotor Renesis. That's because the whole block is only 33 inches, and the single rotor's radius spans 4.7 inches. The MX-30 REV's rotary engine also has direct fuel injection instead of port injection. If you ask Mazda, it'll say it means the economy of the Wankel rotary tech is about 25% better than a normal rotary, and that carbon dioxide emissions are lower too. Mazda increased this rotary engine's compression ratio to 11.9 to 1 to help extend the engine's life. Mazda also made the apex seals thicker. These seals come with a new and specially developed coating to reduce wear and tear. And evidently, you can use the REV's rotary engine to generate electricity for emergencies, camping, or job sites. But let's clarify something else about the rotary engine. If you're a cult fan of the rotary engine, you're probably wondering if it can work on a new RX sports car. Well, the answer is no. At least for now. The thing is, for now, Mazda's priority is to electrify its lineup. That's just where the current focus is. And besides, they're having to play catch-up as it is, since they're a bit behind in the EV game. But now, that's all said. Keep in mind that the rotary engine is the symbol of Mazda. Consider, too, that there's almost a cult-like following of the rotary engine, which has grown over the years. Mazda executive Kota Masui has casually stated that it's an engineer's dream to have a sports car with a rotary engine. But he also said that right now, this isn't the time for it. But who knows, maybe in a distant future, Mazda may reconsider expanding its focus yet again. So is a rotary range extender a good thing? Before we get to that, let's rewind a bit and look at the fundamentals of a rotary engine. The Wankel rotary engine was actually invented by Felix Wankel. He worked throughout the 1950s to develop a new engine that wasn't based on cylinders and pistons. And that's how he came to an engine that uses triangular rotors and oval-shaped housings. Here's how it works in general. The rotor revolves around the housing. A small pocket of air then expands into a larger pocket to create a vacuum. Air and fuel get injected into this vacuum through the intake ports on the combustion chamber. The air and fuel mixture is then compressed against the flat side of the housing. This combustible mixture gets ignited by two spark plugs, and then the exhaust gases are forced out at high pressure. Now, the Wankel engine was new, exciting, and innovative for its time, but it was also controversial and slowly started to fade away from the market in the 2000s. The main reason for this was due to laws and regulations, but not American or Japanese laws. Actually, it was due to European laws, primarily the strict Euro 5 emissions regulations. Mazda had to stop selling its RX-8 in Europe in 2010. It just couldn't meet the emissions regulations of Europe. The reason came down to inherent design flaws with the rotary engine. For example, the rotary engine has lower thermal efficiency than piston engines. That's because of its long combustion chamber, which often leads to unburnt fuel leaving the exhaust, which thereby causes the engine to backfire. If you remember the original Mazda Cosmos, is those things, you turn them off and bang, they'd backfire all the time. Now, rotary engines burn oil by design since oil gets injected directly into the combustion chamber. I'm talking about an oil guzzler. So you have to regularly check oil levels to keep the rotor lubricated properly. And it also means you'll see more yucky stuff coming from the tailpipe, which is not good for the environment. Another thing that impacts emissions is the rotor sealing. The thing is, the intake and combustion occur simultaneously, but in different parts of the housing. That's why the top of the housing is cooler while the bottom is hotter. The uneven temperature makes sealing a lot harder. You can use coolant jackets to help even out the heat load and reduce the problem, but you can't eliminate it entirely. Even worse, because the rotary engine is more rare than common, it's not easy to find parts when repairs are needed. And even if you're able to find the right parts, you still need to find a mechanic who's skilled in fixing rotary engines, and sadly, there aren't that many of them out there. There's also the matter of city driving. When it comes to city driving, the rotary engine has a short lifespan between rebuilds and usually lasts less than 100,000 miles. Some RX-8 owners were able to get a longer lifespan out of the rotary engine, but it was usually the same people who mainly drove their vehicles on highways at steady speeds. All of this is to say, these are the main factors that contributed to the rotary engine dying out in combustion engine cars in recent times. That's not to say that rotary engines stink. Believe it or not, there are a few big advantages to using a rotary engine over a piston engine as a range extender. First of all, you got the size. Rotary engines are smaller than piston engines, so you don't need to design the car around the engine. Instead, it's the other way around. You can first optimize the primary parts of an EV, then decide where to place the rotary range extender. This also helps you improve the overall usefulness of the car's interior and cabin space. 
Another advantage is that the rotary engines are light. Here's the thing that not many people think about. Most owners of typical plug-in hybrid cars charge their cars at night. That means that most of the time they're lugging around a heavy piston engine which drags down the car's fuel efficiency. On the flip side, when you have a small and light rotary engine as a range extender, wasting electricity isn't as much of an issue. Another advantage of the rotary engine is that it doesn't reciprocate. In other words, you don't get the engine vibration and car noises that you experience with piston engines. Now, that's not to say rotary engines are completely silent. They're not, but they're definitely quieter than a piston engine, and it's a more balanced engine with smoother power delivery. To appreciate the MX-30 REV, you have to understand the battery electric version of the MX-30 before it got the rotary range extender. The battery electric crossover attracted customers because it looked similar to the more popular CX-30, and for the most part, was a safe car. On the NHTSA ratings, it received a maximum 5 stars on the frontal crash test for both the driver and the passenger. It also got 5 stars on all side crash tests, and 4 stars on the rollover risk test with a rollover risk of 11.6%. But Mazda sales took a real hit with the MX-30 battery electric car. In 2021, Mazda sold less than 200 MX-30s. For the last half of 2022, you couldn't even order an MX-30 because Mazda said it was sold out. But by year's end, Mazda sales of the MX-30 were just 300. Part of the problem was the battery electric crossover wasn't affordable. The base price started at $33,470, and that was $11,000 higher than its rival, the Hyundai Kona Electric, for example. The other problem with the MX-30 battery electric vehicle was the 35.5 kilowatt hour battery, which had to be charged at least every 100 miles. That's 36 minutes on a level 3 charger, which is a DC fast charger, or a little less than 3 hours on a level 2 chargers for 20% to 80% charge. Since most charging stations are typically level 2, obviously, family road trips could be a drag. That's why the 2023 MX-30 REV now comes with a rotary range extender to bump up the driving range of the car beyond rival cars. Anyway, suffice to say, the MX-30 REV will up its own game. And Mazda fans are already asking the big question. And that's whether the new MX-30 REV will be coming to the U.S. Well, there was a time when Mazda said it would be in the works. But if you ask Mazda today, it's a different story. All we know for sure is that the battery electric version is available in California and only California. But now, you tell me, what do you think of Honda's new V6 engine? And what do you prefer, Honda or Toyota? Please share by commenting below. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support.